Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, we're going to start now. Uh, before I introduce Captain Devanath, I'll just show you a tough clip and then we'll introduce Captain after that. Hari Ram Ji, Chitti. Khol ke padho to bhaiya. Dilli se hai, bete ki. Are, ye to plan ka ticket hai. Huh? Are, sunore, plan ka ticket bheja hai, Hari Ram ke bete ne. Once again, and it is a pleasure and privilege to introduce uh, Captain Gopinath here to all of you. Captain, Captain Gopinath is the founder of India's first low-cost airline setup in 2003, along with his buddies to the Indian Army and the Army Aviation Corps, Captain Samuel, Captain Jayan Kubayar, and Captain Vishnu Rawal. See, APJ Abdulkalam, the former president of India, said. He is generally acknowledged as the father of India's low fare airline that enabled the common man to fly. Air Dekin went on to revolutionize Indian aviation with its noble business model that tightly controlled costs of affordable airfare to the Indian people, enabling millions of first time flyers. Captain Jia Gopinath is also the founder and chairman of the Indian Charters and Aviation India's final helicopter company in the private sector. The helicopter charter business he founded in 1995 blazed the trail in helicopter usage in India. Tekken specializes in activities as drivers, heli tourism, aerial mapping, geophysical surveys, gas pipeline surveys, support to oil rigs, and medical evacuations, among others. Presently, Tekken charter Charters operate and maintain helicopters and fixed wing aircraft across 15 locations in India. Born in 1951 in Elmo village Goro in Karnataka's Hassan district, Captain Govinath studied in a government Karnataka medium school until the age of seven, uh, sorry, until the class of seven, walking barefoot to school. He later got selected to the sending school at Bijapur and joined the prestigious National Defense Academy, the NDA. In 1971, he was commissioned as an officer in the Indian Army and served in the Bangladesh Liberation War. He resigned from the Army after eight years of service in Kashmir, Bhutan, Assam, Sikkim, and other parts of India, 
and decided to chart a new path for himself. Returning to his village, Captain Gopinath took up agriculture on a barren piece of land and within a few years went on to become not only a successful farmer, but also establish himself in India and abroad with his environmentally conscious and effective farming skills techniques. In 1996, he was awarded the Rolex International Award for Enterprise for breaking new grounds with his project Ecological Silk Farming to improve living standards. On 1st November 2005, Captain Gopinath was honored with the prestigious Rajatsava Award by the government of Karnataka. In 2006, he was knighted with the Legion of Honor, the highest civilian award conferred by the French government. The same year, he was also awarded the Sir M. Vishweshwarya Memorial Award by the Federation of Karnataka Chambers of Commerce and Industries. Among other awards and honors, he has also been conferred the Royal Award in the Outstanding Global CEO of the category by Aviation Week. New York, and the Editor's Choice Award by Indian Express with the biggest impact on tourism in India. He is a frequent contributor to major print and online media on economics, enterprise, politics, governance, and societal issues. Without any further ado, I'd like to invite Captain Gopinath to please uh, address the gathering here. Thank you, sir. Thank you, uh, John Levis. Let's see the clock. Ladies and gentlemen, and uh, friends, many of my friends are here. So Actually, when I was asked to come and give a talk, I was a little, I would say nervous, but I was a bit not sure what should I speak on. And though I have been giving talks in IITs, IMs, both in India and abroad, uh, to the Wharton School of Business and Stanford and uh, many associations and convocations, including last week I inaugurated the Mysore Literature Festival. But I was wondering, what is it that I can uh, tell a golf club? Though I play a bit of golf, because I knew that the composition of this club is in a sense a microcosm of New India. In India, which is composite in its culture, in its uh, ethnicity, in its uh, <clears throat> habits um, and pursuits of uh, various uh, interests in life. And uh, so I was not able to get a theme. Uh, like when I go, go, went to the literature uh, festival in Mysore just la last week, about I, I, I sp spoke on the Kannada literature, Sanskrit literature, the English literature, and the French literature, and gave an overarching theme to that. When you go and speak in the uh, college for a convocation, you know exactly what to tell to inspire students. Here you are young people, a lot of people old like me, a lot of middle-aged people. And so I was a bit hesitant, to be frank. Is it true? I mean, what is it that I can tell all of you who are all uh, very aspirational and most of you are from the upper echelons of society, or uh, um, most of you have arrived, you know, you have achieved, you're all achievers. Any, anybody who plays golf is economically uh, well off. You have achieved some success in your social life and your business life. And so that is my worry. 
But anyway, I thought I will touch on a few things uh, because somebody just met me and said he's my he's my son. He's he wants to be a pilot, and um, and um, there may be others uh, who may be pursuing your own careers, even though you are playing golf. So one of my friends, uh, when I asked him, when he when he me messaged me saying that I saw your placard in the club. And I, I sent the same message to him. I said, I'm wondering what can you speak to people like you? And, and he said, you know, golf uh, makes you a philosopher because, uh, you know, you think you're God's gift to mankind and, and a day when you play well, the next day, it, uh, you know, levels you and bring, brings you down to Mother Earth. So, that I thought one was a good theme to begin with. Um, you know, so I'll just say a few words on the various things that I've done. Uh, more than a lecture, it's more a sharing of my story. And I think when you listen to the story, uh, both young and old can pick up whatever the, the you think could be either relevant or inspiring or what you should avoid, the mistakes that I made. Uh, the reason I put out that film was, uh, of course, firstly, to just uh, catch the attention. You know, when we used to take the helicopters uh, for politicians, this is what I learned. The politician would call me and say, make sure you land next to the helipad so that he gets a lot big crowd, you know. Otherwise, uh, the crowd may not come. He gets the crowd because the villagers want to see the helicopter. And then they, if there is a film actor in the election speeches, they would always ensure the film actor speaks in the end so that they don't leave after the uh, politician speaks. So I thought, you know, just to put a film, uh, we'll get some set, some sort of a tone for the my talk. Uh, in fact, I went to a school like the one that you saw there. As you said, my father was a teacher, a poor teacher, as you say, in, in Canada, but I made school uh, because they paid less. Of course, he was not poor as a, as a laborer, but poor in the sense he was getting, I think, 40 rupees a salary when he started his career. And when I was in my fifth standard, that the first day I went to school because he never put me to school for the first uh, uh, four years. He said, you know, so the school is a prison anyway, so I'll teach you at home. So most of my learnings were, like for many of us, for my father and my mother. My father was an agnostic, uh, not an atheist, someone who, who didn't believe. My mother was a very devout um, temple-going lady. And uh, so I observed right in the beginning that my father would read me Tagore, who probably was most religious um, without being religious in the conventional term. He would say, he would read me a poem, you know, whom do, whom do you worship in the dark corner of the room? He is not there in front of you. He is there in the field, you know, where the stone cutter is cutting the stones. So leave your chanting of beer, you know, beads. Leave the chanting of the mantras. He would read a poem like that to me, but he would not be derisive of my mother going to the temple. So in a way, it sort of informed me that Hinduism accommodated everyone. It, uh, oh, sorry, sorry about this. It accommodated. The believers, the non-believers, the hedonists, people who worship pleasure, the sensualists, the nihilists, people from every aspect of belief and practice, it embraced. Not only it embraced, but it also offered. It, it assimilated and embraced, but it also offered 
rich offerings. It gave forth uh, Buddhism, Sikhism, Jainism, which today, for example, Buddhism is almost in one third of the world. So this, was, this came into me right in my younger days from my father. So when he took me in his walks, he took me to the village so the river where he used to swim. And I still remember in that village, Gorur, in the Hemavati River, we had a quarter where the Brahmins would wash their clothes. And we had another quarter where the, the other castes would wash their clothes. And there was a short story in my uncle, Guru Ram Swanga, who wrote that, you know, the, the silly Brahmin doesn't realize that the, 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 the castes, the lower castes, the Gaudas are slightly higher than the Brahmins in the river. And the Dalits are still higher. So, all your orthodoxy is, you know, is of no meaning because whatever they wash, whatever they spit, whatever they do, ablutions, it all comes down to you. So, there was always this, this kind of teaching to me that came because my uncle Guru Ram Swanga, one of the most famous Kannada short story writers, they were rooted in orthodoxy or what they call madibantike. You know, but but their manaviyate, that is their that humanism, their humanity exceeded their madibantike. So in another story he writes that when Ayanga, very orthodox, his son was in Pune. He was calling him to come and stay with him. He was not going because he said, I don't drink from the tap, not even from the river. I drink only from the well. The, I mean, these things still exist. You will be surprised. So he said, look, my wife will draw water from the well because we have a well about 100 yards away. Please come. So he went there with great persuasion. And then uh, it so happened there was a... Dalit from the same village whose son was in the military. So they found who had gone to see him. And this uh, Ayangar Brahmin who went to that uh, Pune fell sick and got admitted to the military hospital. And in the military hospital he also found, by coincidence, the Dalit in the other, other ward. They met each other and he used to joke that, you know, you can't die today without getting operated before you die. And I don't want to get an operation. But so it so ha happened that fate it, that he got admitted there. And then the both the Dalit and the Ayangar died in the hospital. And uh, when their bodies were taken to the ghat, there were about 20 platforms. They were cremated. And when they went to pick up the ash, they picked up the ash next day morning when they were doing the Shastras. One guy who was a very close relative of the Iyengar noticed that they had picked up the wrong uh, ash. And you know, in the Brahminians, when you do a Shastra, you say Pretaha, that means let the uh, you know, soul soar to the heavens. But he realized, but he wanted to stop it. But he said, How do I do it now? Because the other Dalit's uh, ashes have already been taken. The Dalit's ash is the Brahmin's ash. The Brahmin's ash is the Dalit's ash. So he says that the, the Dalit, you know, went to heaven and the Brahmin, you know, uh, was uh, scattered on the earth. So, the reason I am telling this is I am putting it in a context in the, in the kind of situation our country is facing today. And um, I was myself a vegetarian at home and we had these Dalits. Uh, there was a cow which died in your village. The only person who would come to remove it was the Dalit. And if the cow had died in time, they had that native sense to realize that it was a healthy, fit to eat or not fit to eat. And they would take that and they would also eat beef. Um, then they would take the cow, they would skin it. They would give the skin to the local tannery. 
uh, who would uh, take the bonds for the uh, bond factory and he was a muslim and uh, so there was some kind of a uh, though the brahmin would never eat beef or the, even the gauda or a farmer would never eat beef there was a coexistence that they existed without uh, trampling on each, each other so i grew up in that kind of a circumstance so in, if you go to any village today, even Karnataka today, you have the inner quarters with the Brahmins, there's an outer quarter of Gaudas, there's another outer quarter of all these potters, and if there's a river, then you have the fishermen. But there is one which is outside the village, which is the Harijan colony, which Gandhiji or the Dalit colony today. And that is a, my father would always say that there is a sin which all our holy chantings and all the all the uh, waters of the Ganga, Holy Snan will not wash away. And uh, these, these things, you know, always informed me when I was growing up uh, because uh, of my father, who was a, a great Gandhian, who was a teacher who would walk five, six kilometers to the neighboring village to teach. And then he would teach me and he would also teach a few other students. And from this environment, I went to a military school. And I asked my father one day because the headmaster of the school came and said, does anybody want to write an exam for a military school? It was called as a Sainik school. So I did not know what a military school was. So I asked my father, what does a military school mean? Because while walking in the village, even now if you go, you can see Brahmanara Hotel, Veera Shaivara Hotel, Military hotel. <laughs> Military hotel means people who eat non vegetarian. <laughs> and, and so he said, you know, in military they eat non vegetarian, they become strong. So, in, in one sense, I, I was a puny kid. There were other bigger kids. I, I just wanted to leave my village, not with any idea of joining the army because I didn't know much about the army, but largely to. I was a guy who was a kid who was dreaming all the time. So I just wanted to step out. There's a very famous Kannada poem. I'm mixing with Kannada because some of you will know, but I'll translate it. Of another poet of Kannada, which says, Gudiyache, Gadiyache, Gedadache, Hogona, Bandiro, Hosanadike. You know, beyond the temples, beyond the woods, beyond the borders, let us go and seek new lands yonder. So in that spirit, you know, I lifted my hand to write the exam. André Gide, the French philosopher, says in another context, the Nobel laureate, he says, if you want to discover new lands, you have to leave the shore for a long time. You can't discover lands by being on the shore. A ship is made to sail. It is safest on the shore. It is safest in the harbor. But to discover new lands, you have to leave the shore and for a long time. Columbus, who discovered the new lands of America, in the West Indies, but of course he was wanted to discover India. Um, it is said that there's a legend there that he was standing in, in Spain, looking out onto the Atlantic Ocean. And it was the time before um, Copernicus, when the earth was known to be flat, and he stood on the land, looked at the ocean and said, if there's land where I'm standing, if there's water, there must be land on the other side. So that hunch got him to dream that I must discover new lands. And so he went to the Italian kings because he was from Italy, and the Italian kings didn't believe in his, uh, in his uh, uh, dream. And so he went to the Spanish kings and the Spanish kings gave him money. They gave him money, they gave him men, and he built a, 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 a boat, on deck boat, a simple boat, and he set sail to, um, to the West. But instead of discovering India, he discovered West Indies and the Americas. So it is this ability to dream, ability to dream big, that is, that is at the root of all enterprise. So it's Goethe, the German poet, who said, dare to dream 
and begin it. Dare to dream and begin it. Genius is boldness, magic, and power to that. And, and I think all of enterprise is this ability to dream. But it is not enough to dream. Your dream has to be combined with venture. It has to be combined with adventure. It's not enough to, you know, stare at the steps. Yeah, as they say, you have to step up the stairs. Because from knowing to doing, because many entrepreneurs who dream, they do not take that leap of faith from the dreaming to the doing. You always see reading the paper one day, oh my God, I thought of it before. Now, this is my idea. But in the meantime, somebody has, you know, stolen a march over you. So genius is your own thoughts coming back to you with an alienated majesty. So the, this act of dreaming to doing, if you don't have the latter, or whatever else you may have, it's of no use. So there is a point at which analysis cannot go. No, we all have to think and plan, analyze, but there's a point beyond which analysis cannot go, whether it's in business or in life, when you're caught between two parts, or three parts, and what is it I'm supposed to do? I'm caught in a dilemma in my own life. It may be a moral dilemma. It may be a dilemma for whatever you want to choose. But there's a point where you have to take a call and say, yes, this is what I want to do. So you need to listen to that inner voice that comes to you. There is a, a, a flash of light that comes to all of us. There's a magnetic needle, your magnetic needle that is pointing to your true north. You have to listen to that voice. What this case is, is listen to that intuition. You know, the rest is tuition, what you hear, learn in college and school. But that is important. But, but this, these acts of listening to uh, intuition, listening to that spontaneous uh, thought that beats in your heart, I mean, that is the secret of enterprise. Self-trust is the secret of the first secret of success. You need to believe in that particular dream to the extent of your dream and you becoming one in a very, you know, Vedantic way. You, you cannot have a duality. You have to become possessed to the point of madness that the dream becomes you, possesses you, and you're possessed by the dream. And, 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 and then you will not start asking questions. You know, Leonard Bernstein, someone asked him, no, I want to be a violinist. What should I do? And he said, if you want to be a violinist, you will not be asking questions. You know, you'll be playing. So the entrepreneur, you know, will stop dreaming at some point because the dream takes over and he doesn't even realize that the dream has taken over him. And that's what happened to me in each of the uh, stages of my life. So as, as I listened to my headmaster, I, I uh, lifted my hand, dreaming I'm going to leave my village and go. But I went to Hassan, the district headquarters where the exam was given, and I failed in that first exam because it was in Canada, it was in English, and I studied in a Canada medium school. You know, we went barefoot to a school, we stood on the floor. Uh, there are other children who are coming from other 20 villages, some coming as far as five, six kilometers crossing a river, the Hemavati River on one side, the Egrichi River on the other side. And so I came back and I was the only kid in my school who, who lifted my hand. And I came back and told my headmaster, I still remember Mr. Nanjundaya, I said, sir, no, no, I failed. He said, what happened? He said, it was, I couldn't understand the paper. There was a paper in arithmetic, there was a basic paper yeah. in science and the basic paper in uh, English. So, he yeah. heard from me later. After three months, he came back and he said, this Gopi, come and meet me. And again, he announced, does anybody want to write an exam? Nobody went. He called me to his room. I went and met him. He said, I wrote a letter to the Delhi and um, and the letter was your because the exams are held by the Ministry of Defense and um, not from the local state government. 
and the content of the letter was from a village headmaster sitting in a remote village. He said that you are insulting the people of rural India. English is not intelligence. English is another language. If you want people from rural areas, give an exam in the local language. So somebody heard that and wrote a letter saying that we are going to give one more exam. So that was my first inkling that you never take no for granted. You have to question. All the time, you have to question. As Bernard Shah said, in two occasions, you dream. You dream things that you, you dream and ask why? And I dream things that never were and I say, why not? So it's good to hang a question on, on all things that you hold as sacred. Whether people in power, whether people in authority, whether your guru, you have to have the respect, but you have to hang a question. I remember when we started A. Deccan, I'm jumping the story a bit. When we started A. Deccan, I have a great pleasure and also you have an honor to welcome Wing uh, Commander Kotihali here, the first man who flew the light combat jet uh, in India, um, who passed out of the test pilot school in USA, the same school where Neil Armstrong went through and he was adjusted one of the global best pilots in the world. He wrote okay, me a when they came in the newspaper, I'm starting an airline. He says, can I join you? So I called him, I still remember, and I said, you know, you're a test pilot, you know, you're the most legendary pilot in India. Why would you like to come to Deccan? He said, no, I've, I've done my bit and I want to hang my boots and join you. So we just had a dream and nothing else. And the aircraft still did not come. So he was employee number one. And um, so uh, I just saw him now. I remember it for you. But missing. So we, we you, you have to have that uh, uh, ability to question. The reason why I said that was when the aircraft finally came and we were about to launch, there were a lot of you know debates as to whether we should have two air hostesses. We have, we started the ATRs, 48 seater, whether we should have two air hostesses or one air hostess. And I was told uh, the actually the DGCA, somebody called me from Delhi. He said, Captain, I was told that you are having one air uh, one air hostess, you are supposed to have two. I said, No, I checked the rules. It only says up to 48 passengers, one one air hostess. He said, Are you sure? So he was the DGCA who had not read the rules, but Everybody writes in the papers. Uh, so he said, I said, please, uh, please check. The rules are very clear. So then he said, okay, you, you can have a one. Uh, and the, the rules were made in uh, uh, aircraft rules of uh, the, the, the act that holds good even today in India. The aircraft rules of 19, aircraft act of 1934, uh, amended by issued by rules of aircraft rules of 1937 when the helicopter and the jet engine were not introduced. So um, whatever rules are there, it is based on that mother act. So I can quote to the morning you know, instances like this where all the time, you know, you are stopped because a bureaucrat doesn't apply his mind, he applies the rules. And uh, so you are stumped all the way. You are you know, you get stopped on your tracks. But there are also oh. bureaucrats. Uh, so, uh, I'll come to that a little later. So, so I, I went to uh, NDA and I went to the IMA after passing my exam second time in the, in English. And uh, and uh, and um, I, the bar, war broke out. My post was cut short. And then after eight years, as you said, that I came back to my village. And... Um, I built a dam across the river and all the lands were submerged of my family. For 60 villages were submerged under the water. So I just said, I must do something different now. I was a bit restless of this regimented life. It was a great life. 
but I was all the time restless. And it was rumored in my unit that either I'll become a general or I'll get court martial. I used to question all the time. And I thought getting probably court martial would be more likely. And uh, my becoming a general maybe less chance. So I left the army and I came back to my village. And for about 10 years, I was in my, in my, in my lands. And uh, I did various things. I found that uh, farming was tough. My father said, what have you done? And I put all my money in savings to make you an army officer. You left everything and you come back. What are you going to do? But I felt that if I had spent eight years in training, four years in Sinex school, three years in NDA, one year in the IMA, and then another eight years in the army, um, if I can't live on my own, you know, that means I'm, I'm unfit to live actually. You know, if such kind of training, if I can't live on my own. So when I left, I had 6,350 rupees in my pocket. The reason I'm saying this is most people come and ask even today, how did you think of starting an airline when you had no funds? And I, it's true then, it's true today, and it's true tomorrow. Uh, that if you have passion, if you have commitment, and if you have energy, um, that is more important than capital. Capital will find you. So I came to my village and I said, I must do something. Then my father said, all the land is submerged, so what are you going to do? I said, what happened to the compensation? They said, they're given some lands in a very remote area, which is a unreclaimed banking land. So I took my motorcycle, and went there and walked about five kilometers, stood on top of a hill and looked at the lands. And, and I felt, you know, in my bones and my blood that the land was so beautiful. It was on the bank of a stream. I said, you know, if I put my hard work, if I put my sweat and tears, I cannot fail. So I told him I'll go and live on the land and do the cultivation. So I came to Bangalore, picked up a army tent, uh, picked up, a, I bought a dog, a government dog, I had an army rifle with me, uh, army gun, I had a Harijan boy with me, who was in a kind of a bonded labor in the village. I took him and I went and set up a tent in the, in the farm uh, and began farming. I did not know much about farming except whatever I had seen as a child, but what I knew was that had that deep abiding faith that if you work with the land, if I learn as a, as a till and go to the old farmers, I'll be able to make something of my life. It will give me time to take walks, to read, dream, and uh, chart a new life for myself. Yeah. As uh, um, as uh, Uh, Carl Jung said, the philosopher, the psychologist, uh, I, I, I'm not, uh, just, uh, I'm not what happened to me, I'm what, I'm what I choose to become. I am not what happened to me, I am what I chose to become. And Aristotle said in a different manner, choice and not chance determines your destiny. We always have this resignation in the Indian philosophy, which is good in a way, but it is defeatist if it is not taken in the right manner. If you say it was fated, it was my karma, then, then you're allowing destiny to rule you. We all know in our heart sometimes things go wrong. Things do not go as per plan. But if you say it is destiny, there's nothing I can do. But I think the, the, the greatness of a human being is that he, he, knows he knows that all the forces are working against you, that you strive you strive to script your own future. I think that is the underlying philosophy, even in our own Gita, 
which is what when you asked me, though the subject was given by him and <laughs> not by me because that mentioned in some speech, my father would say, you know, dream but do not envy. You know, when he would walk, he would show me the Harijans and not the village of Sahukar, the village, of, you know, the landlord, the richest man. We call them as Sahukar in Canada. He would show me the, the richest man ever to say, when will you become rich again? He would show me the Dalits who work on the fields and say, you complain and the food is cold. You say it's too cold. You don't eat on time. You may throw tantrums. When it's too hot, you say it's too hot. Look at this poor labor. They work till morning to evening. After that, the lady goes and buys a ragi because she doesn't have money many times. Then she grinds it. Then she makes some taste. So you, you always felt more blessed by looking at people who are less fortunate than you. So he said, dream but do not envy. Lose yourself in action, not in despair. Because when things go wrong, do not put your head in your hands and give up. You have to lose yourself in action all the time. So each time I had a setback. There's something in me, there's some kind of an extinguishable optimism. He said, I must get up and start. That is the way out of your troubles rather than sitting and praying. Of course, we all pray, but your prayer must be steeped in action. And uh, in the farm, I got into debt like all farmers, but I got out of debt. Always through innovation and courage. Because the farm was not giving me enough income, I started a uh, Enfield motorcycle dealership company. I was on the way to Hassan. I had gone for some work in the agriculture office. After that, when I was coming back at about 7 o'clock in the evening, it was drizzling. And I said, uh, my bike was giving a bit of a problem. I had an Enfield motorcycle. I went to the dealership. It was closed. And they said, uh, what happened to this guy? He said, sir, he's not coming back. He has closed his shop. So sitting on this motorcycle, I said, there was only one uh, Two motorcycles in those days in uh, India, in the south. But later, Rajdut came. You had the Enfield and you had the Jamba. So I, then a thought came to me that if this relationship is closed, then there must be service required. Because I myself had a motorcycle. Hassan was in the center between Kurg and Chimpanglo. And it was a kind of a regional headquarters for many of the agriculture uh, offices. And so, instead of going back to my farm, I took a night bus along with a friend of mine and went to Chennai and went to the dealership, went to the Enfield uh, headquarters, walked into their office through some my friend's contact, and I said, I come and I want to have a dealership from Hassan. Normally, as you know, these dealerships are taken by established communities like the Banyanas or the Marwadis or the Sindhis or the Chelias. So he said, look, Captain, uh, you know, you're an ex-army officer, you're a farmer. What do you know about business? I said, uh, I said, what I know is that you don't know how to treat customers. You don't even know that your dealership is closed. I have a bullet motorcycle. So something that I told him, and he was impressed, and he gave me a dealership. So I got this Enfield dealership. Then I had about eight branches eventually. Then I added the Honda scooter dealership. Then um, for my work in agriculture, I got a Rolex award. Then I set up an agriculture consultancy for organic farming. So all the time, my mind was like a beehive because I knew that agriculture as a sole income will not keep my body and soul together. And um, so, you know, you need to have that ability I'm not saying everybody should be an entrepreneur, but in whatever thing, that when a thought comes to you, that you should have the ability to listen to that thought and act. And of course, you get into trouble. You know, sometimes your, your uh, headlong rush into things will get you into trouble, but it also gets you out of trouble. So I 
came and started this uh, dealership. And after eight years, I came to Bangalore and I came here because my farm had got done. I had got married in the meantime and I had two kids and my daughter was in boarding and she was saying, I'm going to run away if you don't come, if you don't take me back to Hassan. So I came here to start a, a, some other business in Bangalore. And when I came here, I met a friend of mine, Captain Sam, um, who was a pilot. He and I would play squash in the RSI. And every time I would meet him, I, he, he would say that he is looking for a job. And that's got me thinking. He said, you know, you're looking for a job. And uh, why aren't you getting a job? He said, that, he said, there are no helicopters. Then I looked around because I already had, was in business for the last 10 years. He was a raw pilot, outstanding pilot, a gallantry award winner. He was still in his 40s, um, early 40s, I think 41. But he had no job. And um, I just won my Rolex award for organic uh, work. And one day he said, why don't we do a helicopter company and you know do uh, uh, crop spraying? I said, no, I said, the that is all in the US, you know, you need to have large plantations and the world is going green, you will yeah. not have enough business. Then I was in China with a, a delegation of farmers, of silk farmers. I led a team of uh, silk farmers to China in 1995. And they see in a remote Taluk headquarters, I was stunned because I saw in China in 95, in Taluk headquarters, uh, skyscrapers, five-star hotels, karaoke bars, nightclubs. So China was the night spot and hot spot then and not New York or Paris. And when I met some of them, they said that the Chinese government, which had embraced capitalism without abandoning communism, had realized that you need to provide social infrastructure if you want to get foreigners to come and invest in, in, uh, in uh, China. So there was on my table a, a booklet which said that single window agency. So that was my moment of, you know, epiphany. I said, India was on the way to reforms. Nassim Rao had become the um, uh, prime minister. Um, the states were competing against each other for uh, uh, investments. So I realized that though the elections were fought, and even today are fought on caste lines, if you see today, any election report in every channel, they will talk about how many Jones got it, how many Ahirs got it, or here, how many Gaudas in Gaudas, how many different Gaudas, and how many Purbas, and, and everything is in a caste calculation. And But I somehow realized deep in me that there will be only one caste in the future, which is a consumer caste in that sense. The consumers will drive the change because when you do not get a job, everybody then behaves like a consumer. You do not know which caste the pilot is when he flies the airplane. You do not know who serves your food, which caste is he. It's only the villages that is there. It is only when you want to get your daughter married or a son married, you know, these things come up. And uh, so suddenly it occurred to me that India looked at China like Russia looked at America, France looked at England, India will look at Ch China. And we can't be in isolation. So we had a country on the way to reforms, pilots and engineers without jobs. And third, I suddenly realized there were no helicopters in, in whole of South India, not a single one. So I came back and I said, let's start a helicopter company. I never asked how much does a helicopter cost? I didn't know. Thank God I didn't ask for it. Because ultimately when we mortgaged our, our site, Sam and I mortgaged our site in uh, um, my small uh, apartment, it, was, it, it would not even fetch two blades of a helicopter. But the thing was that, that you, you were so much possessed by the dream. But even then I knew that I'll get the money through venture capital. So the first venture capital we went to was ICICI um, or TDICI. 
and um, he was a wing commander he was a wing commander's son he said captain this is a fantastic idea my father is a pilot i'll recommend to the head office and after 15 days a letter came saying that we are going to invest only in technology and uh, so these were the early days of venture capital the reason i am saying is that you know you are going to have doors shut every time you start want to start something new something different but each time a door shuts or 10 doors shut the 11th door will open in a very again mythological sense if you see that krishna giving that uh, sari to draupadi it is it is you have to read it in a very symbolic manner saying that that if you don't give up even when you pray if you continue not giving up doors will open and doors did open and we got funding from two or three people so in a sense you have to sell your dream and what is selling dream for an entrepreneur is that you give him shares and out of if you got 100 shares you give him 10 shares and you take 10 lakhs so we got the funding from the company and we started with one helicopter in bangalore the reason i am telling this again is that you know you are you are failed only you're not a failure you are a failure only when you quit i think the glory of man is not in falling or failing the glory of man is in rising each time you fall and that is the art of life and that is the art of business and we must have got knocked down so many times it took us 3 years to get our license 3 years but we never had a timeline saying that after 6 months you know we will give up because sam in the meantime had gone and got a job as a security officer and administrative officer so he was shocked i said look you are a pilot then um, i said look why don't we do what you are telling let's start a helicopter company and i just gave him a plan he went walked away but after 3 months he came back and he was not leaving the office i said why have we come you're not leaving because i have my work he said you asked me to join so i'll resign my job and have come so you need to have this ability to and that sincerity and that passion yourself to get other people on board to join your dream and that's how air deccan was built our deccan was built in those days and we started with uh, one helicopter and within a few years maybe 5 years 6 years 1997 at the end of 3 years we launched we start we went from one helicopter to something like about 17 18 helicopters and about two three small planes so it was not as easy as i'm making out every step you will have obstacles but you have to face it and there is corruption and that's the reason i said don't lose yourself in despair there is corruption even prabhu darasa said 1500 years ago or 1000 years ago satyavantarige idu kalavalla this is not an age for honest people so it has always been there it is there and it will be there there is corruption there are bureaucrats who take money there are politicians who take money but there are also bureaucrats who are good who when they see your sincerity if five bureaucrats take uh, take money there will be one who will come and bail you out and this is exactly what happened to me i came here i wanted to have a place in bangalore my helicopter was in hl i still remember when the helicopter came and uh, they were charging uh, something like about 500 rupees a day and suddenly i got a letter from uh, next month we'll charge something like about 3000 rupees a day then um, i went to the chief minister at that time jahej patel from janata party and we all know that there is as i said corruption in all the parties so i went to his state i never went to a middleman so if you go to a middleman and say with money saying that you know get me something uh, fool and his money are soon parted Um, and so i met the chief minister i went straight to him i said look uh, next time you officer i want to set up a helicopter company i can do it in, in chennai i can do it in hyderabad um, 
but I want to do it in Bangalore. You have uh, HL here, you have BL here. Why don't you do it in Bangalore? And this is exactly what he said. He said, what do you want? I said, I want an aircraft land in the Jaipur airfield, which is still there. And uh, he said, not only will I give you land, but I will also use your helicopter. And as I was sitting with him, he called the uh, principal secretary, Mr. Vishwanathan, and he said that by tomorrow evening, five o'clock, I want this letter to be issued. You know how difficult it is to get a land. I want by five o'clock tomorrow evening, a letter to be issued that one acre of land is allotted to him. And uh, as usual, uh, once we got the letter, somebody objected, saying that you know, a helicopter in this airfield will interfere with the government airfield. And um, the IAS people are very smart. They know how to move an obstacle. They also know how to remove it. So he called me and said, Captain, what do you want to say to this? I said, look, Chicago has 3,000 flights a day. Every, every 30 seconds is a flight landing or taking off. Is it, this government flying school is on the ground, not flying. So more flights should come and give to others also. But somebody should um, moderate it. There should be air traffic control. So he appointed a, an Air Vice Marshal Lamba, who is here. And um, he said, um, since this guy is objected, he said, uh, can you put a report? And he put a report saying that it can be overcome and land should be given. So that's how land was given. And uh, he called uh, uh, the chief secretary and told him, I will not use the existing helicopter, which is very old. I'll use the Deccan helicopter because it's new. So he became a, a big um, patron. And that's how we got, we got started. You know, as you know, the, the first obstacle is always the most difficult. And within uh, three, four years, uh, in 2003, uh, 2002, when we had about 15, 16 helicopters, I would get a lot of calls every day from ministers, including Chandrababu Naidu and Krishna, uh, CM there. You know, why don't you start a flight to Bellari? Why don't we start a flight to uh, Hubli, you know, on the helicopter? And I said, no, that's too costly. Um, but this bus was in me that there's a new India, a new India of possibilities. So it was the story of my life, the story of American, the India of possibilities. And uh, uh, so that bus was there. And, and, uh, and suddenly, when I was coming in a helicopter once, along with my other colleague who's not here, uh, Colonel Povaya, and... Uh, and I said, look, there's something we are seeing when, as we fly. Can we fly down a bit? It was all flashing like mirrors. And I found there were dish antennas. Every, on every village in those days, you had these 30 feet wide dish antennas. So I had a helicopter view. And then when I went to the, go into the village, I could see in the village, all these farmers sitting in, you know, there were about 50, 20 farmers. In the, village, in the village had about 500 houses. They would sit along with the cattle and watch television. And what did they see in, in the television? You know, uh, 24 by 7 movies already, uh, news and entertainment. And in between, you know, advertisements, advertisements for buying Hero Honda motorcycles or just Maruti 800 car, or a toothpaste or a fair and lovely cream. It was a new India. And suddenly I felt that it was not an India of uh, uh, 1 billion hungry people to be fed and subsidized. That's how India was always seen. That's how we all see ourselves saw. We're getting aid from America, the wheat aid, the PL480. When you go and say, give me aid, give me an aircraft, then you're seen differently. But when you are a consumer, when you are a buyer, if you're a billion people, a billion hungry consumers, and then a billion hungry people to be fed and subsidized and the country becomes different and powerful. Then Rolls Royce will stand in front of you, Boeing will stand in front of you, and Airbus will stand in front of you. And that's how we decided that we'll start the, the low-cost airline. And the idea of the low-cost airline came to me because when I was on a Southwest Airlines flight in the US, there was a carpenter sitting next to me in his shorts and his fully tattooed uh, arms, eating a burger. And I said, what do you do? He said, I'm a carpenter. That's when this thought came to me. And all these people were buying maybe maybe 
one guy in the whole village had a car and two guys had a motorcycle I'm talking of 90 2002 and when i was going to hassan in chajra patna small park headquarters i found computer suit so i went up small 10 by 10 feet and there's a local guy who couldn't get a job they started a computer school so i could touch it and feel it that this is completely a different country and uh, i said why well, can't carpenters so i can't um, mechanics travel in the way as we know today uh, you know between an officer and a mechanic you want the mechanic to go there first if a factory is shut down you want a mechanic to reach there before the IAS officer or before an army officer because he's the guy who's key to get the plant going. And uh, so I said, why can't we have clerks, nurses, the, the true backbone of the economy, why can't they fly? So you have to dream the impossible. You have to dream something which is crazy because whatever looks crazy today 10 years since 20 years since if you follow the dream it, it is something which looks you know simple and normal so i said we'll start a low cost airline and the aim was not to compete with jet airways because they had only three airlines then sahara jet and edekin i said we must compete with the trains because when I was in Southwest uh, on that flight, when I got down in Phoenix, I saw a board there and I, and I feel like this, that, that airport flew, uh, had thousand flights a day, one airport, back of beyond, not Chicago. Chicago had 3000 flights. Phoenix had 1000 flights a day. And I had this sense for these trends and big picture. And I knew that India had then 400 flights a day, all over 40 airports put together, we had only 400 flights. And this one airport had 1,000 flights. So you don't, you don't need uh, a, a, be, be a rocket scientist to realize that whatever India may not have, India has a market. So I came back and I did not go to McKinsey again, you know, because I said, in Canada, there's a problem. You know, if you have an absence in your palm, do you need a mirror? The mirror is your guru. The mirror is some other entrepreneur who has succeeded, or Narayan Murthy, Bill Gates, or a consultant. So we just announced we are going to start an airline. And within six months uh, after the announcement, uh, we started the airline. And uh, what I want to say a few more things is that during the flight, it, it transformed the whole country. Because entrepreneurs uh, have to not only uh, build a new product, they have to change the consumer behavior. And this <laughs> film was made because in one flight when I was coming from Delhi to Bangalore, there was a, you could make out at least about 30% people were first time flyers by their look, by their dress, by their clothing, they would have their bister and uh, bedding, and uh, they don't know how to wear a seat belt. So this lady, uh, when the flight landed in Bangalore, I still remember, she saw through the door, the pilot sitting there, and she, husband was there, but she was more voluble than him. She said, Captain Saab, Hanuman pilot He kept on showing, you know, this Hanuman brought that mountain, so that's how I got that idea. I said, what does your son do? He said, my son works in Infosys. And we used to have a lot of these one rupee tickets and 500 rupee tickets on every 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 airplane. That is basically to create an implosion in society, change the uh, uh, consumer behavior. And we must have given more than three or four lakh uh, one rupee, 500 rupee tickets. You know, as you know, in every flight, there will be some seats which are empty. The idea is never be empty. There's a guy who goes in one rupee today, he'll come back at 2,000 rupees on the return flight. So I think I've spoken a little longer than um, what I should have. Um, uh, I would like to just uh, end my, my talk. Uh, to say that 
There's a lot of talk today about India, uh, our mythological past. Of course, it is glorious. Uh, you know, that we had this and we had that. We had, we had in, uh, in uh, the bronze casting in India, our healthcare, our drainage system, the iron smelting, the Pachalohas, um, and many aspects or in mathematics, 1000, 2000 years ago, at that period, compared to the rest of the world, we were more advanced. If you look at uh, any of our ancient temples, you will know that it was a land of uh, great people. If you look at the Upanishads and the Vedas, it is it's a land of a spiritual quest. It never accepted uh, given wisdom and question. It always questioned. It always assimilated. It allowed everyone to coexist. But somewhere down the line, because of uh, our uh, history of invasions, colonial room, we have lost something. So today, there's no point saying we had Pushpak Viman. You know, all countries, which are old ancient countries, have this kind of mythology. You know, in this mythology, if you say Hanuman crossed the ocean, and if you similarly see it in the Greek mythology, people, you know, opening the sea or uh, uh, killing an enemy. Uh, by shooting his heel because like the Helen of Troy and Achilles heel it's mythology, it has to be when you read Ramayana though we had 500, 600 kings but there's something that knit India together which was Ramayana and Mahabharata in the Puranas but while it knit them together it cannot be read literally no, if you become too much of a cynic and say that how could Hanuman, you know, cross the ocean? I mean, these are metaphors, these are allegories, you know, which are given to exaggerate the good versus the evil or portray a picture where a, a, a character is made so powerful, like when you say Sam, Samson or you know, uh, Hercules. You, you can't question it. You have to read it as mythology, but what is the underlying thing? That they all had, like the Iliad is a, um, a metaphor for uh, life is a battle. The Odyssey is the metaphor for life is a journey. In the Mahabharata, in Ramayana, is a metaphor and an allegory for that life is always a battle between the dharma and the adharma. That's how you should read it. And, and it shows that dharma wins in the end. If And they also portrayed all our gods as humans. You know, On the one hand, it says Krishna is everything. He is the Lord. He sees everything. But at the same time, uh, he is made to act like a man. You know, he tells... Uh, Karna in one place. Uh, kill um, Arjuna now. Kar Karna says, no, I have to wait because I, I'm a warrior. Arjuna says, I'm a warrior. He's removing the wheel, which is stuck in mud. So I want him to come out. But he says, don't fall for uh, brotherly love. This is Yuddha. And the, and the rishis and the gods tell them to lie. In, in Mahabharata, you know, they say you lie to win the war. So it is presented throughout as a battle between the good and evil, between the kind of battles that we ourselves, you know, feel in life. But the underlying theme of all of it is that love and humanity is bigger than everything else. In, uh, in Bendre, in uh, one of his poems, one of the greatest poets of Kannada, it says, Avanu 
ಬಡವ ನಾನು ಬಡವಿ ಒಲವೇ ನಮ್ಮ ಬದುಕು ಹೀಸ್ ಪುವರ್ ಬಟ್ ಲವ್ ಇಸ್ ಅವರ್ ಲೈಫ್ ಆಲ್ ಗ್ರೇಟ್ ಲಿಟರೇಚ ಆಲ್ ಗ್ರೇಟ್ ಮೈಥಾಲಜಿ ಈಸ್ ಸ್ಪೀಕ್ಸ್ ಆಫ್ ಹ್ಯುಮ್ಯಾನಿಟಿ and in hinduism much more than humanity reverence for all beings so when you say is an advaita advaitam anantam advaitam anandam that is the one is infinite you are in the infinite the infinite is in you and advaitam is anandam you know it's also joy and love so we are seeing today from many of the educated classes the kind of politics that we are having the kind of division that is being sown that a country with all its problems and and divisions that we had it was always some linkage was there it was always there but there is a, a a kind of poison or a virus that is spreading where increasingly there is division in society so we have to rise above our differences because great literature great work of art as i said truth is beauty and beauty is truth truth is love and love is truth and when gandhi was asked what is god he said god is truth so all of them all the great saints look at in in kannada you have karnataka you have kanakadasa he said kola kola vendu horadada adadiri you know don't keep fighting on caste do you know which caste you belong do you know which which caste is your atma do you know which caste is your life you are living force pampadi is called the adi kavi in kannada he is he was a jain poet who wrote the mahabharat and uh, pampa said manushya jati valam vande kulam there is only one kula which is the manushya kula so our own kuvempu kv putappa who is called kuvempu who was rooted in the kannada uh, and the our ancient scriptures who took 14 years to write ramayana darshanam was a great kannada poet great kannada essayist novelist he took 14 years he said it was like a vanavas himself to write ramayana darshanam in, in poem then you know when he was asked in one one fun farmer asked him he said you you have written it in poetry how do i as a farmer read it then he converted it into prose and he says with all that what is he saying the, the underlying theme of ramayana is that humanity lives on love lives on these larger principles of life which you see you, you see yourself in everything and everything in yourself in, not, not just human beings all life and he said manuja patha vishwa patha like tagore he said manuja patha there is the is a great uh, uh, you know humanist humanity humanitarian and vishwapatha and tagore said the same thing so uh, i would like to end by saying that the golden age for india though it was a golden age for all of us all countries say we had a golden age the golden age for india should be a, not in our past but in our future to create a great country that stands united and i just want to read a small uh, prayer by tagore which i think is appropriate for this time let the earth and the water the air and the roots of my country be sweet my god let the earth and the water the air and the fruits of my country be sweet my god let the homes and marts the forests and fields of my country be full my god 
Let the promises and hopes and deeds and words of my country be true, my God. Let the lives and hearts of the sons and daughters of my country be one. So, thank you so much. I'm not sure if I were able to address a very diverse audience, which as I said is itself a microcosm of our new India. Uh, but if there are any questions at this time, I can answer one or two of them. I just want to share the name. I'm Rajeshwari Vishwanath. I come from your neighboring uh, district, Mangalore. Mm. I met you uh, long back, that may be around 14 year, years back in uh, Century Club. Okay. That time, uh, my son had come back uh, failing in NDA exams from Allahabad. And uh, I just shared that with you. You gave uh, me a book, Wings on Fire. And you wrote a line in that, don't lose hope, keep trying. And uh, he failed, uh, the, he was in first year engineering. He failed NDA, he continued his uh, engineering. And uh, he had taken uh, TOEFL, GRE, everything in simultaneously, had taken UPSC and uh, SSB, Mysore, CDS. Uh, he cleared and he is a pilot now oh. in Indian Air Force. He flies Jaguar. Right now, he's doing fires in Samar. Oh, excellent. So sure. that book is still uh, is there in his library, in his, in his house in Ambala. The other day when I went, I saw that book and I was just recalling yeah, the meeting I had with you and that, of course, he was not there uh, I mean, in the meeting, but I just gave that book to him, what you I took from you. That was, I, I, I saw him, he always used to keep that book and used to go through it all the time. Thank you, Thank you so much. Actually, when I was in uh, Mysore in the literature festival, mm -hmm. after the, my talk like this, someone came, the organizers and brought a old man, you know, I think he was a retired uh, uh, old man uh, from, I think he was from a very middle class family and he had a tattered magazine in his hand and uh, he said, sir, I believe her. his daughter was a pilot in Edekan, so he wanted to meet you. So he came and, and he opened it to me. It was 2006, um, one of the business magazines where I'm there with her inside the aircraft cockpit. Uh, and she's now, I think, flying in uh, Air Asia. So it's very heartening, you know, when I'm curious, I accept these talks that uh, even if... This I was can, just for uh, inspire, if wants you know, to become a pilot. Then. And if I can inspire one person. Uh, yeah, then he made, a, coming. It made a difference to him. Thank you. Thank you. Huh? Where do you see India go from Your today? Name? I'm Indra Lakshminare. I think uh, the way we are today, where are we going? I think, uh, uh, you know, you know. in fact, I wrote an article uh, which said that uh, it's coming a book now on our India. It said that uh, is India uh, I, the title was that uh, the, the danger to India is from uh, the, 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 the danger to Hinduism is from pseudo Hindus. And from, uh, the danger to secularism is from pseudo seculars. We have uh, um, Hindus. In the other day, in the Calicut Literature Festival, somebody stood up. And after I talk, I gave a talk like this, but it was more on, on literature. And he asked, uh, can a Hindu be a terrorist? Can a real Hindu be a terrorist? I said, he, he cannot be, but if he's a terrorist, he is not a, a, a real Hindu. He's a pseudo Hindu. And similarly, um, a terrorist from Islam, the, you know, religion, uh, is not a true Muslim. He's not a 
true follower of Islam. And as you know, in Quran, I have not read the whole Quran, I have read it here and there. Quran itself says that to each country, you will have its own prophet in its own, in his own tongue. And if any of you have the time, if you read the principal Upanishads of uh, Radha Krishnan, uh, one of the foremost philosophers, was also a teacher, thousand pages, but uh, even I have not read the whole thing. I read parts of it, but his hundred pages of introduction. Throughout that book, there are references to Quran, the, the Bible, the uh, Zoroastrianism, the existential philosophers, the nihilists, and but, but, but also talking about what true Hinduism is. Hinduism has always been a quest for, it is a spiritual quest. Tagore says in one place, uh, uh, what language is thine OC? He says, yes. what language is thine OC? Uh, he says, the language of eternal questions. And what language is thy O sky? Is the, is the language of eternal silence. So to the ultimate answers, even in the Upanishads, it only says you have to realize it by constant uh, inner search. And so if anybody gives you an answer, that means, uh, uh, you know, people who have dogmas have answers. People who want to search the meaning of the world, meaning of the universe, the question uh, uh, whether a, a great uh, scientist like Einstein, he said, I'm, uh, I don't believe in religion, but I'm a religious man because I look at the mystery of the world. But all of them, they preach um, love. You know, love is all. Love yeah. unites. And anything else, you know, divides. So we have to ask ourselves and not follow uh, any any dogma either of the leftists who are rabid leftists who sometimes preach violence or the rabid right which preach violence. You know, uh, violence cannot be the answer under, under, under any circumstance. You know, Girish Karnad, whom I knew very well, he used to wear this urban naksu and uh, go to these uh, many of these meetings because they called him urban naksu. He, they said, do you want social media to be blocked because they're all abusing you. He said, no, let them have the right, but there should be no violence. I mean, that is the spirit of uh, our country. All our uh, great Jnanapita award winners, including, you know, uh, many of our ancient uh, uh, philosophers in Canada itself, they all preached only one thing, including, including Basavana or, or Kanakadasa or Puradadasa, they all preached love, just like Jesus preached love. So I think all of us have a have a um, you know stake in ensuring. For example, the other day I got a just recently I got a, a message from a retired IS officer, um, which said that uh, a WhatsApp it was forwarded, and uh, it was a video of uh, Lakshmi Meter. <laughs> it said that uh, you know in India Muslims are becoming a majority, and and then you use a four-letter word. What the fuck about this? And you know, use the four-letter word in that video. It's a one and a half to two minute video. And I said, should have knew that is a fake video, for example, uh, where it was denigrating one community. And because yeah. of Lakshmi Mittal, you know, is, is a businessman who lives in London, all his businesses are in many countries. Including his first business was in Indonesia, where the majority are Muslims. He has businesses in Middle East. He has businesses in everywhere. He will never speak a word against any community or religion as a businessman, even as a purely in business interest. So I just sent him a mail. I said, how can you send a WhatsApp message which is totally false? And even if it is true, if somebody had said it, you should not forward it because you're preaching hatred. Right. You know, uh, he said, no, I sent it because someone sent it to me whom I knew. I said, no, you should check. So I think uh, we all have to question ourselves and not accept things um, um. can i ask yeah, yeah. Uh, <clears throat> your name yeah, i just want to uh, vijay mirchand yeah. uh, all the passion you had 
uh, all the obstacles that you faced, uh, the hurdles, you overcame everything to start the airline. Uh, then you disposed of it. Yeah. Can you shed some light on that? <laughs> okay. Anyway, anyway, maybe you should read my book. But anyway, I'll tell a few words since you asked. You know, um, when when I built the airline, as I said, I did not put any money. I hardly put any money. Like many people, like Flipkart. And like so you start with an idea. So one is you control the company and take 30 years, 40 years to build it. So you may not be able to build it. And uh, like in India, you know, it goes to your son or grandson. Eventually, the son or grandson will build it. But you don't want to let go of the company. And I knew that uh, in a field like airlines, where I'm coming myself from a middle class family, an ex-army officer, have no political contacts, no uh, inherited wealth. When you build a company, you build it on your passion and dreams and energy. And there was this, you know, an entrepreneur needs to have three things. He has to be a, an optimist. You know, you have to have incurable optimism, like the farmer, you know, regardless of the failure of crops, regardless of uh, all the calamities, he goes in the morning and starts blowing. He never disbelieves the sun will not rise, it will not rain, or the seed you put will not sprout or you will not harvest. So an entrepreneur must have optimism. You know, if people who want certainties cannot make entrepreneurs. If the bird, you know, the first day when it flies, jumps out of the nest. So you have to take that plunge after due thinking and find your wings in the flight. Second, you have to have uh, perennial enthusiasm. You know, I got the wisdom of many philosophers, including Kugampu, who said, Jada Vembu De Illa, Chetana Veyella. There is no inertia. Everything is Chetana, is, you know, your enthusiasm. So you have to have that. And when you build, you know, what I did was I took money from various people and gave them equity. But I took a large chunk of money uh, once uh, from uh, an investor who gave 5 million. Then within six months after launching the airline, I got 50 million. Uh, all because we had this airline flying. And we had uh, about five eighty hours. And when the 50 million came, I got reduced along with my other friend, Captain Samuel. We became you know, something about 13, 14% each. So now everybody together had 75% and we together had only about 25%. So when uh, the airlines, uh, suddenly after the second uh, success of Deccan, six other airlines came, you know, Go First, uh, what is that, um, Spice Jet, Indigo, another Prime, a lot of these airlines came. And the oil price went from 21 rupees to 150 rupees, or uh, 157 barrels of oil. And the airports were crumbling. Uh, we had no pilots, we had no engineers, you know, poaching. And uh, suddenly in the morning, you know, flights are canceled because 10 pilots had left and joined Kingfisher. So we we're going through a lot of crisis and I needed more funds. And the other investors were investors who had invested to multiply their money. And so they put pressure. But what actually triggered it was in one um, meeting because we had listed uh, Deccan and a lot of individual investors who had retired from the army, retired from bank, retired from as a lecturer. They had put money, 10,000, 20,000. He said, he said, Captain, when are we going to get our returns? That was in my mind. Also, as an entrepreneur, you are wedded to your idea. Actually, you are married to the business uh, more than your own wife sometimes. And you are a man obsessed with a madness. And I was deeply conscious that there is a thin line becoming like between like genius and a madman between going bankrupt and uh, uh, staying afloat. And at that time, the investors who are really big, they did not put money. I said, you put the money, I'll get reduced. They said, no, uh, we want to exit. And because Deccan had already become the largest airline with hardly any debt, and but we needed more money because we were still requiring money. 
we had already become the largest airline in india we had overtaken jet airways we had uh, 48 aircraft we had put 48 aircraft in 48 months and uh, we had uh, we were going to uh, we were doing about uh, nearly 400 flights in a day and we were going to 70 cities about 30 cities were the first time cities which were never on the air map so at that time it was a very attractive uh, proposition and uh, my investors put pressure on me. I felt maybe if something goes wrong, and I said once that my checks are flying faster than my planes. And uh, I said, then you know it will collapse. It will suddenly overnight collapse. Then uh, I felt it, uh, it's not right for me to hold on to my dream at the cost of investors' money. And that's how I agreed to uh, so, in a sense, um, Vijay Malia, I mean, didn't rob me of money, though he's in bad, bad light these days. But maybe he dropped me off or robbed me of my personal dreams. But I think the dream lives on in the country in the, in the shape of that particular model. Uh, in fact, once uh, CK Prahlad called me from, uh, you know, I think Jaisalmer or Jaipur Airport, he said, Captain, I'm here in the airport and I can see Lambani's with their bister, you know, boarding the flight. Because he had just written a book called Bottom of the Pyramid. So I want to come and meet you. So it had changed the uh, complete uh, landscape of India. So in a sense, I'm happy. But the people who invested made a huge amount of money. The first person who had given 5 million sold it for 45 million. Another gentleman who had given 1 crore. When we started Deccan, sold it for 140 crores. And uh, the people who had put 50 million, they sold it for uh, close to 200 million in the end of four years. So, but but everybody, you know, benefited. The country benefited. Okay. We're done. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Uh, can I call Colonel Ramesh and move into the second box? Hi, Ravi. Hi. Good to see you. The batchman of mine. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Good evening, everybody. I'm Colonel Ravi Sharnagam. It's, it's an honor to pass the word for thanks to. My dear friend Gopi, we joined uh, the army together in June 1971, fought the war, he in a different front uh, with the army mission as an infantryman in Bahamut. Uh, I must say that uh, though, although he says that had he, uh, good thing he left the army, but I'm sure, and I've got this conviction, had he stayed on, he would certainly have become a general. <laughs> Uh, depriving the rest of the country of this opportunity that he that he created uh, by building this airline called Deccan Airways. Uh, I, what I, all said and done, I mean, uh, Gopi has gone down definitely in the annals of uh, in Indian aviation history by setting up this low cost airline. I mean, at that time, if you take your mind back, there were hardly any airlines. And uh, it costs you an arm and a leg to fly. To, to open up this sector, that vision that he had, and he says that he did it with devotion and uh, passion, I, I can uh, vouch for that. He created that thing out of nothing, fought all the odds, and we used to hear stories when he was, uh, because the other two colleagues of his are also co-mates, Sam and uh, Jayant Poo. I am surprised Jayant is not here, or is he? So uh, they really put in a lot of work uh, building this airline together. So many disappointments, as you can imagine, to fight a bureau Indian bureaucracy is not the easiest thing in, uh, to manage. Uh, on that note, I would uh, uh, like you to give him a standing ovation for what he has done for Indian aviation. The last thing that you know, any successful entrepreneur is intended to 
he is greatly indebted. He's I mean huge debt indebted to many of my colleagues and people who worked with me. I don't think it would have been possible without the founding members, Sam, Jayant, and Vishnu uh, Rawal, and also the most important, the early team who left their jobs and you know when we had nothing except you know a, a dream, who joined us. I think. Uh, uh, or, or, uh, they are the unsung heroes. I have taken all the credit. Thank you. A token, As, uh, a token of appreciation by the President KGA to Gopi. Thank you. 